Well, we're returning today to our series entitled Crisis Facing the Unexpected. We're in Isaiah and chapter 38, and this chapter tells the story of a godly king, Hezekiah, who faced an unexpected crisis suddenly, right in the middle of this man's life. He was afflicted by an illness that brought him to the very point of death. So that in verse 1 of this chapter, Isaiah the prophet comes and he says, Set your house in order, for you will die, you will not recover. Now, the thing that's important to remember in this story is that Hezekiah was a godly king. The Bible says of him, He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. So, what we learn here is that godly people suffer. You see that in the story of Hezekiah. You see that, of course, in the story of Job in the Old Testament. And you see it, of course, supremely in the life and ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, we're looking at the story of a godly king, and here's the question, how did this godly king respond to this crisis? Well, he prayed. Verse 2, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, and he prayed to the Lord. Uh, Isaiah the prophet then left the king's bedroom, uh, headed home after his visit to the king, But before he had even left the palace, the Word of God came to him a second time. Verse 5, go and say to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. And behold, I will add 15 years to your life. So, this is a wonderful story about a remarkable answer to prayer. But its particular value for us is that after he recovered, Hezekiah wrote down a candid confession of what he experienced, what he went through, as he walked through this unexpected crisis in his life. And what Hezekiah experienced in this crisis recorded here matches exactly what we are experiencing right here and now today. We saw last time that Hezekiah felt fragile, that he felt anxious, that he felt weary, that he feared being separated from the people he loved. He feared his life being cut off, being cut short, and he even feared the possibility that God Himself might even be against him. So, last time we looked at his anguish and saw how his experience speaks very much to ours and how we must let our anguish lead us to Jesus. Now, today what I want us to see in these next verses, verses 15 to 17 that we're looking at today, I want us to see Hezekiah's faith. And we're going to learn three things about faith together. First, that in a crisis our faith will be tested. Then we're going to see how your faith can be strengthened and how your faith can be assured. So, first then, faith tested. And here we're looking at verse 15. What shall I say? For he, that is God, has spoken to me, and he himself has done it. I walk slowly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. Now, when you go through an unexpected crisis, your faith will be tested. Remember, that Hezekiah is writing after he recovered from the illness. We have that in verse 9. And looking back, well, he's full of thanksgiving. 
What shall I say, he says, because God has spoken, and God has done what he said. The words that God spoke, of course, are recorded in verse 5. God said, I have heard your prayer, and I will add 15 years to your life. And God did what he said. He has spoken to me, and he himself has done it. God healed him. God brought him back from the very point of death. And when he recovered, Hezekiah's rejoicing in answered prayer. But when he was going through the crisis, it was a different story. Look at what he tells us honestly. I walk slowly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. You see, when this godly king suffered, he struggled with bitterness. In fact, verse 17 says he struggled with great bitterness. Lord, I've given my life to be godly. I I have pursued this. I have served you. And now in the middle of my life, you allow me to be afflicted to the point of death. God, that's not fair. That's what this king is saying. I walk slowly because of the bitterness of my soul. Now, friends, I love the honesty of this. This man doesn't come out of the crisis and then look back and say, oh, yes, of course, when I was afflicted, I just trusted the Lord. No, he tells us the truth. When I was afflicted, I struggled with bitterness. Why me, Lord? What in the world are you doing? He's telling us that when he was afflicted, a battle raged within his own soul. He trusted God, yes, but when the crisis came, trusting God wasn't so easy. Now, perhaps there's been a time when your faith has been tested. Perhaps you're finding that your faith is being tested right now, and you're wishing that you were doing better. And if that has been your experience, would it help you to know that it was the same for the most godly king in the Old Testament? Hezekiah did not come out of this crisis with some kind of a note of triumph. He has to confess honestly that when he suffered, he found that his faith was not as strong as he thought. I had great bitterness. That's the confession of this godly king. His faith was tested. And friends, when you face an unexpected crisis, your faith is going to be tested too. But I want you to notice what Hezekiah says in verse 17. Behold, he says, It was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. In other words, he's saying, God used even this for good. God used the exposure of the weakness of my faith for good. This is like Romans 8, 28 in the Old Testament. God works in all things for our good. Even when we find that the weakness of our own faith is exposed, what Hezekiah is saying here is, God used that for my welfare, for my welfare. I had great bitterness. Now, how could God use this man's bitterness for his own good? The answer is in verse 15. Looking back at the bitterness that he felt, Hezekiah says, I walk slowly all my years. Now, walk slowly here simply means walk humbly. Some versions of the Bible translate this phrase that way. I walk humbly all of my years. In other words, here's what he's saying. 
I used to think that my faith was strong. But when the unexpected crisis came, I didn't do so well. I wish I could look back and say I trusted God all the way. But I can't say that. I have to tell you that there was great bitterness in my soul. But God used even this for my welfare. God used it to humble me. I'm done with priding myself on the strength of my faith. From now on, I will walk humbly. I will walk slowly all of my years. You know, friends, pride lurks in all of our hearts, and spiritual pride is its very worst form. And God may use a crisis to humble you. God may use this crisis to humble all of us. And He may do it by showing us that our faith is not as strong as we like to think. Do you remember that that is exactly what happened to Peter? At the Last Supper, Jesus says to the disciples, where I am going, you cannot come. And Peter's so confident about the strength of his faith. Oh, you know, these others, they may be weak, but I'm a man of great faith. I'm one who's committed to the pursuit of godliness. And so Peter says to Jesus, why can't I fo follow you? I will lay down my life for you. You see, he thought his faith was so strong. But you remember the story how later that night it only took a servant girl to be asking him, aren't you one of the disciples of Jesus? And then Peter discovered that his faith was not nearly as strong as he liked to think. God used this to humble Peter, to make this very self-confident man more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why later in the New Testament, amazingly, you find Peter the gentle pastor, writing these words, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that in due time He may lift you up. You say, Peter wrote that? Humble yourself? Yes. How? Because God used the exposure of the weakness of his faith to make him more like Jesus. So, here's the principle. An unexpected crisis will test your faith, and God can use this to make you more like Jesus. So, if you come to a time in your life when your faith is tested and you don't do so well, let that experience humble you. Let it show you how much you need Jesus and then thank God that your salvation does not depend on the strength of your faith, but on the strength of your Savior. That's the first thing, faith tested. And that's going to be our experience. It is our experience today. Now, here's the second thing that's very important, and we have to get to it. How then will faith be strengthened? And I want you to see from the story how the tested faith of Hezekiah was strengthened and how our faith can be strengthened today. Look at verse 16 with me, if you would. O Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. O restore me to health and make me live. Now, it's hard to be certain of the precise order of events in this story, but I think that this is the most likely reconstruction. Let me try and describe the flow of the story to you. Hezekiah becomes sick, verse 1, to the very point of death. Despite being a godly man, 
he struggles with great bitterness. Isaiah the prophet visits him, comes into his bedroom, and says, verse 2, set your house in order because you're going to die. You're not going to recover. The king then turns his face to the wall. He prays, and he weeps bitterly. Isaiah the prophet's on his way home, leaving the palace, but he hasn't even got beyond the boundaries of the palace when God speaks to him again. Go back to Hezekiah. And so Isaiah the prophet comes back into the king's bedroom and speaks the word of God. Verse 5, I have heard your prayer. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. And then Hezekiah prays in the light of that with new faith and with new confidence, the words that we're looking at right now in verse 16, oh, restore me to health and make me live. Now, notice the pattern. As we look at these verses, God speaks in verse 15, and verse 5 tells us what He says, I'll give 15 years to your life, I'm, your prayer is heard, your prayer is going to be answered. God speaks in verse 15, and the response of the king is He prays in verse 16, O oh, restore me to health and make me live. Now, here we learn something very important then about how faith is strengthened. Remember, the king has struggled. He's been facing great bitterness. How then is his faith strengthened in this struggle? Well, first, faith is strengthened by the Word of God. How did Hezekiah overcome this bitterness? And when a crisis comes to you and you discover that your faith is not nearly as strong as you thought that it was, how is help going to come to you? Well, the answer to that question is that faith is strengthened by the Word of God. Man shall not live, our Lord Jesus said, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Your faith will be strengthened by the Word of God. That's why when you're in a crisis, you need the Word of God to be drip-fed into your life. That's why we open up the Word of God right now today, because by this means, God will strengthen your faith when you're struggling with bitterness. But then notice something else very important about faith that we learn here. Faith prays for what God has promised. God speaks in verse 15, the promise recorded in verse 5, I'm going to add 15 years to your life. And what does Hezekiah do? He prays in response to that promise. Faith prays for what God has promised. Lord, you say you're going to add 15 years to my life? Do it! Heal me! Make me live! Give me these extra 15 years. Now, I spoke last time about my pastor, Derek Prime. One of the things that I learned from him and that he said very, very often was this, always pray with an open Bible. I'm so thankful for that. Always pray with an open Bible. In other words, look at what God has promised and then turn what God promises into your prayers. That's exactly what Hezekiah models for us here. When you see that God has promised something in the Bible, the right response to that is to pray that what He promises will be yours and that you will know it in your own experience. This is what faith does. It prays for what God promises. And let me give you some examples. So, you're reading through, let's say, the book of Philippians, and you come to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 17, and it says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And you say, look at that, Christ gives strength. Now, what are you going to do at that point? You've read this in the Bible. Are you going to say, oh, that's nice, God gives strength, and carry on? No. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to say, Lord, I see in Your Word 
that you give strength. I see that you give strength for particular situations, and I'm asking that you will give me the strength to bear the burden that I carry at this time. That's turning God's promise into your prayer. Or to give another example, I, I read in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8 about people who love Christ and believe in Him, and they have an inexpressibly glorious joy. Now, what am I to do when I read that? Am I to say, oh, so some Christians have more joy than they can put into words? That's really nice. No, I'm to say, Lord, if it's possible for others to have an inexpressible joy because they know you and because they love you, I want more of that joy in my life. Will you give me more of that joy? And then I'm going to look in the Scripture to say, is there any clue here as to why they had that joy, how they came about having that joy? And I'm going to see in the verses that come just before it that they know they have a risen Savior, that they have a living hope, and that they have a glorious inheritance, and in the light of that, they have an inexpressible joy. Lord, help me then to see the value that is mine in Jesus Christ, that even in the hardest circumstances of life, I will find joy in what you have given to me in and through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When you see in the Scripture that God promises to forgive, the right response to that isn't to say, oh, well, there's a good thing. God promises to forgive. No, it is to say, Lord, as I repent of this sin, will you forgive me? You turn God's promises into prayer. That's what faith does. Faith prays with an open Bible and turns what God has promised into prayer so that it will become part of your own experience. So, here's what we're learning together from this Scripture. It's very important, especially in these days. When you face an unexpected crisis, your faith will be tested. It really will. And here's how your tested faith is going to be strengthened. Faith is strengthened by the Word of God. Make sure it's being drip-fed into your life. And then faith will pray for what God has promised. The promises of God will strengthen your faith, and your faith strengthened will then turn the promises into prayers so that what God promises will actually become yours. So, we've looked at faith tested, and we've looked at faith strengthened. And now, thirdly, I want us to look at faith assured and verse 17 in love. Oh, this is such a marvelous verse. In love, you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Wow. Will you pause and just try and take that in with me right now? You know, when you face an unexpected crisis and your faith is tested, here are three things that you can always say for sure. The first is, I am loved. In love, in love, you have delivered my life. Literally translated, the words here are, you loved me out of the pit. Isn't that beautiful? God loved me out of the pit. Nothing in life is surer than the love of God for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves you, and He has proved that forever by His self-giving to you, 
the Father gave his one and only Son for you. And on the darkest day of your life, you can say, the Son of God loved me, and he gave himself for me. God did not redeem you because he had to. The Lord Jesus Christ was under no obligation to leave heaven, to be born into the world, or to go and die on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. No, he chose to come. He chose to lay down his life, and he did it in love for you. How great is the love the love that the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. In love, He predestined us for the adoption of sons to the praise of His glorious grace. Nothing in life, death, or eternity will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brother, sister in Christ, when you face an unexpected crisis, you can say with confidence, I am loved. And then you can say with confidence something else that is very wonderful, I am saved. Notice what he says here, in love, you have delivered my life from what? Well, in love, you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction. You see, there's much more here than Hezekiah recovering from a serious illness. No, you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction, the place where all who go are destroyed forever and forever. You know, the Bible speaks about an eternal destruction. Think about that, an eternal destruction, a destruction, a tearing apart that never ends. We hear a great deal in these days about fear, fear of the coronavirus, fear of a great recession. Listen to the words of Jesus, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Now, remember, Hezekiah was a godly king. And as a godly king, the worst thing that this man could imagine would be to live and to die in your sins, and then to find yourself in the pit of destruction forever and ever. And he says from a full heart, oh God, thank you that you have saved me from that. Friend, Jesus Christ came into the world to save you from the pit of destruction. He came to save you and me from the hell to which our sins would rightly consign us. And he came so that by faith in him, at the lowest point of your life, you would be able to say to God in love, you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction. Aren't you so thankful to God for that today? Friend, whether things today for you are better or worse, whether you find yourself today in sickness or in health, whether you are facing the prospect in these coming weeks and months of being richer 
or being poorer. In Jesus Christ today, you can say, I am loved and I am saved. And then there's one more thing in this wonderful verse that a Christian believer can say with great confidence, and it's this, I am forgiven. Notice what he says, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Now, notice here how it is that God saves us from the pit of destruction. How does God do that? You have delivered my life from the pit of destruction. How? Well, notice the connection. For, this is the explanation. Here's the reason. Here is what God has done in love. And here is what he has done in order to save you and me from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Now, godly people know that our sins are many. In fact, the closer you walk with God, the greater the awareness of your own sins will be. And what we're learning here is that there are two places and only two places where sin can be. One is before God's face, and the other is behind His back. Either your sins are before God's face, or your sins are behind His back. It's one or the other. And friend, the great question that will determine your eternal future is not whether your sins are few or many, but are they before God's face or are they behind God's back? And Jesus Christ died for our sins. He bore our sins in His body on the tree so that when you repent of your sins, God takes them from before His face and casts them behind His back. Do you see that that's exactly what is being said here? And I love this word, cast. You have cast, cast all my sins behind your back. See, in Jesus Christ, when you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God removes our sins. He puts them in another place. He takes them from us as far as the east is from the west. He flings them out of sight. He throws them behind His back. And not just some of them. You have cast all my sins behind your back. Matthew Henry has a very helpful comment on this. He says, when we cast our sins behind our back, God sets them before His face. But when we set them before our face, in true repentance, God casts them behind His back. You see what He's saying? The easy thing for us to do is to cast our sins behind our back. Oh, yeah, well, it doesn't matter. Oh, I've moved on. Oh, I don't need to worry about that. And so, you just ignore it, and you move on and never come to real repentance. And Matthew Henry is saying very pointedly, as long as you're just casting your sins behind your back and ignoring them, the reality of your life is your your sins, though you may be ignoring them, they're right in front of God's face. So, here's what you do. You bring your sins before your own face in genuine repentance. And when you do that, God casts them behind His back. And when your sins are behind the back of God, 
you can cast them safely behind your back as well. So, here's what we've learned today in these remarkable verses. Faith tested, faith strengthened, and wonderfully, faith assured. Friends, one of the realities that surely is pressed home to all of us in these days is that life is much less certain than we like to think. We make all our elaborate plans, and a tiny virus throws everything up in the air. But brothers and sisters, how rich we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see this today? What a marvelous thing it is to know that on the darkest day of your life, you can say with confidence, I am forgiven. I am saved. And nothing can ever separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And friend, if you have a Savior like that, you can face any crisis. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come profoundly aware of our own weakness and of the degree to which our own faith is tested and often shown up to be less than we like to think it to be. Strengthen us as we move through these days in which we live. Strengthen us by your word. Grant that we may pray what we see and what we believe that what you promise truly may be ours. And thank you. Thank you today that in Jesus Christ, whatever we face, we are able to say with confidence, I am forgiven. I am saved. I am loved. So may your grace reign in our hearts For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.